potluck, right? Mm -hmm. Can we do a Polish food potluck? <laughs> you said it wasn't food. I said I wasn't sure. <laughs> now Only I'm if we don't stay here too long. <laughs> Um, so anyway, we'll do that on February 11th, so please make a note in your calendars, and, uh, and we'll do that then. Join me, if you would, please, in the book of Titus. <coughs> Titus is in the New Testament, sort of towards the back, five T's, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much for this body, Lord. I thank you for the, the warmth that they have. As a community, Lord, I thank you for the genuine love that exists between these folks, Father. I love them, Lord, and I know they love me too, and I thank you for that, Father. I pray, Lord, that in, in the spirit of love and community, we, we hold tight to doing what's right. Help us, Father, just to, to navigate difficult situations, Lord. I pray, Lord, that as we approach your word this morning, that you speak to us, Father. That we be changed not as a result of a good sermon or a great worship set, Lord, that we be changed because of your word and because of your Holy Spirit speaking into our hearts, Father. Show us where we need to grow and show us who we can be. And I thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, why Titus? Why Titus all of a sudden? You see, we've been working our way through John, and uh, as we've approached the new year, I thought, okay, we're going to take a little bit of a break. We did some Christmassy stuff. I hope you had fun when we went and worked with, uh, with Rives Baptist. Uh, that, that was fun. I think it was the no, fire. No, it's not. not are, are, you, are you on? Not on? <coughs> I don't think so. Better you need battery. I have a green light. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, oh. I can see what happens when you miss a week. I don't know if I'm rolling okay, that way. Dog wants to remember that. We can hear the Jeopardy theme song. He's learning that batteries live in the remote, so when he needs batteries, he takes the remote apart. That's my grandson. Oh, my boy. Oh, he's looking. Can you, can you hear me okay if I just talk really loud? From down here, it's more loud. From down here, it's more loud. Yeah, that moves the camera. And everybody else can move up. It's okay. No. No, just, how about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Feels like I'm more Speaking of batteries, not a problem. Yeah. The, 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 the only thing I want to do is not. You can do a small switch. You know what, I, what was interesting? Uh, is that uh, our hand at this quote unquote larger church, and they had the oh, same kind of technical uh, issues and, and, yeah. and bumps and all that. All that. Yeah, I'm off camera. <laughs> Yay. Okay. <laughs> We're never going to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to introduce our pastor who's going to be now. <laughs> Take two. Okay, are you done? Is everybody done? Man, I tell you what, this it's good to be home. Good to, I feel like the prayer has expired. We need to pray again. Right? We just have to cut the offering. Are you... Are you <laughs> Ouch. Man, there's a whole bunch of unhelpful suggestions. Here. Are you taking notes about this? See what happens when you give us a week off? Go back. Backslid. What's a green do? Join me, if you would, please, in the book of the Bible called Titus. Well, let's do this thing, all right? Let's get this taken care of, all right? Why Titus? Well, I, I wanted to do some, some preparatory messages in preparation for uh, our annual meeting. So that when we talk about the church, we have already talked about church things. Like, what does it look like to be a healthy church? What is a church supposed to do and be? 
And in my mind, it was like, okay, I'll just do two topical sermons at the beginning of the year, and it will be okay. And do you know what the Holy Spirit does to me when I think about a topical sermon? He convicts me. Because I want to talk about the Bible. I want to speak not, oh, there's the Bible over there, and here's a bunch of verses that go together about a topic. I want to speak to you from the page of Scripture, because this is where I think God's authority rests, Amen. in His Word. Amen. And so, I, as I thought about, I'll just do a couple of topical things. It was like, oh, how could I do that? How could I do that to myself, first of all, and then to you? And so I started thinking, okay, how, how can I speak from the page of Scripture and address some of the issues in the church? And the Lord just kind of said, well, speak from Titus. Speak from Titus. Because Titus is one of those books of the Bible that deals with the church. And it's a, it's a great book. I've, I've done some work in Titus before, and I really enjoy it. So uh, Titus chapter 2 is actually a big favorite. I used to assign this to students in a Bible interpretation class. And uh, so Titus chapter 2 is a big favorite. I've looked at it a, a lot. And if I'm going to preach chapter 2, why wouldn't I preach chapter 1 and chapter 3 on the ends of it? So for January, what we'll do is 1, 2, 3, assuming we get anywhere near through chapter 1 today. At the rate you guys are listening, it's going to take a while. <laughs> we'll do chapter 1 this week, chapter 2 next week, and then chapter 3. And Titus addresses issues of the church. So moving to the actual introduction here. Why Titus? Because it talks about the church. One of my favorite books uh, is a book called Endurance by a man named Alfred Lansing. Endurance is about Ernest Shackleton's journey to Antarctica. Now you think it's cold here. Think about Antarctica for a minute. And think about making this journey in a wooden ship. You'd have to have a specially designed wooden ship to deal with the ice. And this is like 1915. So think about 1915. I know none of you were there. Some of you were a little bit closer than I was. And you're in a sailing ship. Now there's a steam engine on the boat, but it's a sailing ship. And it's going to Antarctica. How do you get help? You don't. There is no help to be gotten. You have to be absolutely self-sufficient. Well, as the, as the boat gets into the Weddell Sea, uh, it gets trapped in the ice, and it gets crushed pretty much to matchsticks. Uh-oh. That's your ride. And your ride has now been crushed. So the, the men were able to get supplies off the ship. They were able to get the 21-foot boats off the ship. So now they have to go over land and over pack ice to a remote island, a remote corner of Antarctica. And then they have to send three men in a 21-foot boat on an 850-mile journey using manual navigation tools. You know, you think sextant and, and star positions and all that kind of thing. And if they're off by just a little tiny bit, one way or another, what happens? They're gone. They're just gone. What is the ocean like at the bottom of the world? You see, there's nothing to stop it as it swirls around and around and around. It's the most hostile piece of ocean you could ever be on. And can you imagine trying to hold an instrument on the deck of a 21-foot boat doing this to catch a star position and measure where you are? a little intimidating. I think, no thank you. They left 22 men behind to wait for rescue as these three men left in this small boat. They had a goal. They had a desperate goal. Missing by even a little bit would doom all three men on the boat and all 22 men left on the beach. They had to keep at it. As you, as you read through this book, you see their, you can see their journal entries kind of day by day. And they had to fight discouragement. They had to fight each other. They had to eat the sled dogs. I mean, just over and over, there's these situations that you just can't even imagine. And then when the guys get to, they actually made it to the island that they were shooting for, 
and they were on the wrong side of the island. They couldn't, they couldn't just take this boat and like start the motor and go to the other side of the island. There was no motor. It's a sailboat while they have oars. They had to go over land. So they hit the side, the, the wrong side of the island. They had to go over land, glaciers and such, to get to the whaling station where they were finally able to get help and go back and get those men. They had a goal, they had to keep at it, and they needed feedback. They needed to keep checking their position as carefully as possible to make sure that they arrived at the right place. You know, when I think about the early church, the early Christian church in the first century, the outcomes were uncertain. You see, uh, Christianity wasn't a legal religion when it first started. Right? The, uh, the Jewish people, well, okay, the Roman Empire had a concept of legal religion. And if you were a legal religion, you would offer a pinch of incense to the deity of the emperor every year. So every year, everybody who followed a religion whether it was, you know, Zoroastrianism or this, that, or the other, you would, every year, you'd make a pinch of, offer a pinch of incense to the deity of the emperor. Can you do that, Christian? Neither can the Jews. And so the Jews had an exception clause because the Jews would just sacrifice everyone and not do that. They would refuse. And so the Jews had a very narrow exception clause. The Jewish people did not have to offer that incense to the emperor. When Christianity began, they, they were seen as a sect of Judaism, okay? So the Baptists are a sect of Christianity. The Brethren are a sect of Christianity. For a while, Christianity was seen as part of Judaism. How would the Jews feel about that? No, thank you. And so they began to distinguish themselves from the Christians. So now Christians were operating an illegal religion in the Roman Empire. Well, the Roman Empire is known for its warm, friendly, open relationships with people, right? They're known for tolerance and inclusivity and come on, kumbaya, everybody. No, this is the Roman Empire. You will do what the Roman Empire tells you to do. So you have the Jews trying to get rid of the, of the Christians, I mean, they're trying to get them to sleep with the fishes. And the Romans were sporadically trying to get the Christians to conform with their expectations. So you have early church leaders often being jailed and executed by the Roman Empire. How would you like to build a religion when your leaders are being hauled off to prison? That's tough, right? Hey, come to our church. It's great. Yeah, our pastor just got arrested. Oh, what did he do? Something bad, right? And you think about the Christian religion is founded on the person of Jesus Christ who was executed as a political criminal in the Roman Empire. woo -hoo. This is a tough sell. And yet people became Christians because of the reality of Jesus Christ, the reality of who he is and what he's done for us. People flocked and became Christians. So the Apostle Paul, who was uh, jailed frequently and eventually executed by the Roman Empire, wrote this letter to Titus, giving him guidance and authority to establish the church on the island of Crete. Titus is one of Paul's disciples and co-workers. He is a Gentile, not a Jew. He traveled with Paul, learned from him, and eventually was entrusted with several different tasks. He was actively involved in the administration of the early church, and Paul eventually sent him to the island of Crete, quote, to correct a deteriorating pastoral situation and appoint elders. Huh. Now, that's nothing like what I've been asked to do here. This isn't a deteriorating pastoral situation. But Titus was sent to Crete to, because, specifically because there were deep and abiding problems in this church. The people of Crete. Uh, Crete is a challenging assignment because of the culture of the people there. A poet from Crete, a pimp, at the, at, yeah, that guy, described the people as always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. 
The historian Polybius says this, So much, in fact, do sordid love of gain and lust for wealth prevail among them, that the Cretans are the only people in the world in whose eyes no gain is disgraceful. As long as you made money, that's okay. That's what Crete was like. Crete sounds sort of like modern America, doesn't it? They're greedy. They're lazy. How would you like to go start a church there? Or fix a church there? Our ability to do the right thing is often conditioned by our friendship. So what's happening in the island of Crete? You have this island community where uh, there are ports, there are places where you can have ships come in and everything, but the culture is relatively static, and it's bad because everybody's a liar. How hard is it to tell the truth when everybody's a liar? I mean, you think about corruption. You go to a country where there's corruption, how do you uh, talk to some of your missionary friends? How do you get by with the police? Well, you have to pay them a bribe. Oh, we don't do that. We're Americans. You go to South America, you do. You know why? Because the culture has gotten so corrupt that that's just the norm. So Crete has a corrupt culture. Characterized by greed and dishonesty, and Titus has to go there and establish the church. Paul's letter to Titus gives him instructions in his task and authority from Paul to appoint elders in every town to guide and strengthen the church. These letters were often written to us for specific occasions, and this letter to Titus is basically Paul telling Titus, here's what I want you to do, and I'm giving you the authority to do it. So look with me, if you would, please, at Titus chapter 1. You see, Titus has been sent to Crete to finish establishing the church there. In the first four verses, the theme is this, godliness is the goal of the church. Just give me one second. <clears throat> I'm fighting the cold and mostly winning. Paul, the servant of God and apostle of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now in his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Letter introductions are usually uh, formal. Like, there's a form that goes with them. Just like when you sit down to write a letter, you say, Dear name of recipient, it's been a long time since I wrote you a letter, but now here I am writing you a letter. Right? That's how we start letters. Or, I recently heard from you, and here I'm writing you back. That's how we start letters. So, in Titus' letter here, or in Paul's letter to Titus, anything that changes from the normal letter format should stand out, should pop at us a little bit. Paul points out here the content of his ministry as an apostle. This is like Paul's purpose statement. In order for the church to succeed, they need faith. They need confident trust in God. They need knowledge of the truth, and this all should lead to godliness. You know, when I, uh, when I talk to some people, <clears throat> they, they think that if they have the right thought, then that is godliness. Now, it's, it's important to think correctly, don't get me wrong, but I can sit in my office and have the right thoughts about God. What good does that do anybody? It doesn't do any good about to anybody until I come out of my office and do the right things as a Christian. You see, it's not just thinking the right thing, but it actually has to influence my life and has to come out at some point. Paul's purpose statement here is he is, when he wakes up in the morning, his goal is to further the faith of God's elect. Who are God's elect? You, Christians. You believe the gospel, you are God's chosen person. And Paul, his ministry is to increase your faith and their knowledge of the truth. So trusting God, knowing about him, that leads to godliness. And godliness is the key <laughs> word here. Godliness is the kind of respect towards God that shows up in your life. 
so that you do what he wants you to do out of respect. A dictionary definition of godliness refers to a sense of awesome obligation. A sense of awesome obligation. So godliness doesn't start with just doing the right thing. It starts with an internal attitude of love and devotion to God so much that you will do what's right. My grandchildren love the Paw Patrol. Um, now, if you aren't familiar with the Paw Patrol, let me catch you up. The Paw Patrol features these dogs. Marshall is the fire dog, right? And he, he has a catchphrase. Um, I'm all, let's get fired up. Let's get fired up. That's Marshall's catchphrase, sorry. Uh, Chase is the police dog. So Chase is on the case. That's his catchphrase. There's a whole bunch of other ones. There's Sky who rides a helicopter, and um, her catchphrase is, let's take to the skies. Uh, there was Rocky, who is uh, the construction guy, and I forget his catchphrase, but there's all these dogs. And they're in Adventure Bay, and they go solve problems shouting their catchphrases. Oh, we need the digger, get Rocky. Oh, we need the police, get Chase. Oh, we need the... So they're all solving these problems. My grandsons go bananas for this stuff. They run around the house in their Paw Patrol pajamas, solving problems and shouting catchphrases. This is the kind of thing, like when we think about godliness, it's an awesome respect towards God that comes out of our life. These little boys love the Paw Patrol so much that they want to be them. They want to be like them. Godliness for us is this attitude of love and respect towards God that yields right behavior, that yields correct doctrine. Andreas Kostenberger says this, Conversion must lead to growth in knowledge. Yet this knowledge but not, must not be an end in itself, but rather one that is in keeping with godliness, mature Christian character. So when we come to Christ, it's not, whew, I'm done. We come to Christ, and then we grow in maturity, bit by bit and piece by piece. The goal of Paul's apostleship is to lead Christians into faith and knowledge that results in godliness. Desiring to do what God wants us to do. This reverent love and obedience, this is reverent love and obedience towards God. Then he also points, uh, Paul also points out the eternal life that Christians will have. You see, godliness is not just for now. Godliness prepares you in some sense for the life that you will live forever with God. So you become more like him now, so that when you step from this world into the next, it's almost like you've prepared yourself. Godliness prepares you for life with God. This life with God is not only everlasting, but it also shares the qualities of the life of God himself. It's indestructibility and it's joy. <laughs> Instead of putting on I love Jesus pajamas and running around the house solving problems, God wants us to put on the character qualities reflective of godliness. godliness to respect and revere him in a way that comes out in our lives. That way we live the kind of life that he wants us to live. This has been the goal of Paul's apostleship. Paul has something he's shooting for, to increase the faith and knowledge of the church so that they become godly people, reverently in awe of him and doing what he wants them to do moment by moment, day by day. Has the goal changed? No. The goal that Paul had as an apostle hasn't changed in the life of the church at all. Now, has the church gotten distracted? Not this church, the church in general. Yeah. There are a lot of, there are a lot of good things that distract us. This is why our church mission statement says, meeting people where they are on their spiritual journeys and then leading them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. A fully devoted follower is a mature disciple characterized by godliness. If you have, it's almost like there's these two things in tension. Meeting people where they are. Absolutely. We want to meet people exactly where they are. But do you leave them there? Man, thank God he didn't leave me there. On the other side, there's this mature, fully devoted follower of Christ. I'm, I'm about maybe over here. I'm still working my way there. 
And so it's like you have on the one side meeting people where they are, on the other side fully devoted follower, and you're you're pull, pulling them together. Because we should all be fully devoted followers of Jesus. I heard you shout amen. <laughs> Paul moves from his description of his ministry as an apostle to instruct Titus in his work on the island of Crete. Titus is to set the church in order by appointing godly elders. Godliness is the goal of the church, and that starts by meeting people where they are and leading them step by step towards maturity and godliness. Take a look at verse 5, please. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what, left, what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So godliness here requires discipline. That's one of the words that just really popped out to me. The character of an elder is that he's blameless. So there's this overarching character quality that an elder or leader in the church is supposed to be blameless without blame. That's short. We don't expect people to be perfect, right? I hope you don't expect me to be perfect. Allow me to list my imperfections. Actually, Ruth Ann, would you like to? <laughs> Here's your chance, babe. <laughs> She's not going to help me. <laughs> Blameless is this overarching cap character quality or overarching category, and there are five knots. There are five uh, vices to avoid. Overbearing, quick-tempered, given to drunkenness, violent, and pursuing dishonest gain. Can you imagine on the island of Crete that there might be some cheats there? And there might be some drunks there? There might be some violent people there? Yeah. Are there those kind of people in the society that we live in? Absolutely. Are they qualified to lead the church? Absolutely not. And so, uh, what do we do with that? David Brooks says this, Character is built in the course of your inner confrontation. Character is a set of dispositions, desires, and habits that are slowly engraved during the struggle against your own weakness. You become more disciplined, considerate, and loving through a thousand small acts of self-control, sharing, service, friendship, and refined enjoyment. If you make disciplined, caring choices, you are slowly engraving certain tendencies in your mind. You see, on the island of Crete, they have slowly engraved bad habits and tendencies and character qualities in their lives, and now they have to re-engrave over the course of time, bit by bit, piece by piece, what is good and right. There are seven qualities, seven virtues to cultivate and practice, to be hospitable, to love what is good, to be self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined, and to hold firmly to the trustworthy message. Basically, to, to be orthodox Christians and to teach and preach what is true Christianity. Titus is told what kind of elders to appoint, but these character qualities, uh, one of the ways we can use this list is to say, this is who I need to be as a Christian. Because shouldn't we all aspire to have the character quality of a leader in the church? Absolutely. That's a picture that we can put out there and say, I'm not quite there yet. Maybe I'm not as self-controlled as I'd like. Maybe I'm not as hospitable. I find sometimes I'm not a very nice person. I'm not. How do I become more nice? I have to practice. I have to practice niceness. And when I feel like not being nice, sometimes that's when I have to be nice, especially. <laughs> Paul doesn't tell Titus how to develop the character of an elder. Presumably, Titus already knows. But Christian authors who write about spirituality point out the importance of discipline. Uh, Richard Foster says this, Once we clearly understand that God's grace is unearned and unearnable, and if we expect to grow, we must take up a consciously chosen course of action involving both individual and group life. Group life. It starts with having a goal in mind. It starts with setting a plan in order. Christian disciplines are not the end in themselves, but a means for God to work on us. 
Foster also says, God has given us the disciplines of the spiritual life as a means of receiving his grace. The disciplines allow us to place ourselves before God so that he can transform us. When I read the Bible, I read the Bible for information so that I know certain things, but I also do it as a habit so that I place myself before God and say, God, speak to me from this page. And he does. There's so many times I look at Scripture and I'm like, oh, I don't measure up here. Or, man, there's somebody in, in my circle of influence that I need to encourage in this direction, that I need to be nice to. <laughs> these character qualities help us define the godliness that characterizes a mature disciple and we are all called to be mature disciples to reach a goal you need to picture the goal and as we work on the goal we need discipline to keep at it and then you need feedback to track your progress Paul describes the character of an elder which is identical to the character of a mature follower of Christ we use this picture to establish the goal of Christian maturity for ourselves you see, when those men were on that, on that little boat, they couldn't take a day off checking their position. They couldn't just be like, ah, it'll work out. No, because if they missed by just a little bit, if they slapped even a tiny bit, they'd be lost. The same thing's true in growing our Christian character. We can't slap off. We can't just decide, well, I'm going to take a week off of Christianity. That's not Christianity. Christianity is moment by moment making disciplined choices and doing what God wants us to do. Not just individually, but also as a community. So that we have goals as a community that we look uh, that we try to achieve. The church has to appoint elders who are examples of good progress along the road to godliness. People we can look up to and get help from as we grow into fully devoted followers of Jesus. I look at these things and I think, where, where do I need to grow? And where do we need to grow? What are the character qualities I need to work on? I think about self-control. I'm thinking about self-control a lot. Anybody else in the new year decide to make more disciplined dietary choices? It's either that or I'm going to have to buy bigger clothes. And just, just rock it, you know, just, just enjoy it. I've been eating salad. Lots of salad. I had Polish food, yes, but I've also had to have lots of salad. And I tell you what, I love cheese. You know? <laughs> I'm preaching to the Dikarskis now. That one back there. <laughs> Eat it without the bun. Eat it without the bun, yeah. But it just comes back around to making disciplined choices. How do you lose weight? Folks, I lost 80 pounds as a, as a truck driver. How did I do it? Well, I had to start saying no. And I had to say no, and I had to say no, and I had to say no. That's just what you have to do. Why is godliness any different? <laughs> See, godliness is the goal, and it requires discipline to grow towards it. It also requires correction along the way. Thankfully, there were, um, uh, I use a little app on my phone called MyFitnessPal, and you record everything that you eat, and it tells you when you've eaten the wrong thing. And you can have friends. It's almost like a Facebook for your diet plan. And you can have friends who cheer for you. And when you log in a couple of donuts, you can have friends who can say, hey man, what's up with the donuts? Godliness is the goal. It requires discipline to grow towards it. It also requires correction along the way. Take a look at verses 10 through 16. For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced. Because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. <coughs> Therefore rebuke them sharply, so that they will be sound in the faith, and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. In Christian love. I feel like that should be added there. This is harsh. 
Because if you're off track in terms of godliness, you need to be corrected. I need to be corrected. Because what's at stake? What's at stake is the life and health of the church. The problem in the church in Crete is rebellious people. Well, in the island of Crete, you can just kind of imagine. These people who, as a culture, have degraded themselves to the point where they're just corrupt all the time, always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then Paul says, this is true. Man. I think that Titus had the opportunity to say, uh, Paul, you're sending me to Crete. Can we talk about this? This is a tough job. What's at stake? The life and health and vitality of the church. There are a lot of different descriptions of these people in verses 10 through 16. Perhaps it's easiest to summarize by pointing two things. They have a corrupt mind and they have a corrupt conscience. When the mind is corrupt, it means these rebels are not thinking correctly about God, about themselves, or about other believers. And when they act on these incorrect thoughts, it results in disrupting households and meaningless talk. They focus on Jewish myths instead of Christian truth. When the conscience doesn't work correctly, a person cannot discern between right and wrong actions. They claim to... Uh, I'm sorry. It results in cheating others for dishonest gain. They claim to know God but deny Him by, by their actions. The result is that they are unfit for good works. Imagine that you create a robot, but you don't wire its brain correctly. And you try to teach the robot Christianity. But it's not thinking right. So you can tell the robot, okay, robot, Chris Darling is a nice man. And the robot says, Chris Darling is a nice man. Yes, Chris Darling is a nice man. And then the robot says to you, Jesus is a nice man. And you start to think, no, hold on, yes, yes, he's a nice man, but then no, he's also, he's also God. And then the robot spits out, Chris Darling is Jesus. Ah, uh, I'm going to have to rewire this robot. Because it is not as good a guy as Chris Darling is. I love him with all my heart. But my robot's not thinking correctly. Chris Darling is not Jesus. Right? And so the people on Crete are thinking incorrectly, and Titus has to go in there. He's going to sort of rewire them. Say, no, no, no. Not that, but this. Jesus is a good man, but he's also God. You have to put those two together. And robot, you have to realize that Jesus is a unique person. He is unique and special. And Chris can't be him. Titus's responsibility is to silence the opposition using sharp rebuke if needed and bring them back around to the faith. They must be silenced by sharp rebuke. That sounds like fun. <laughs> When I, taught, uh, when I taught Bible at, at New Tracks, back when it was New Tracks, I had a student, uh, you, you assigned homework, right? And a bunch of college freshmen come in, about 120 of them, and you assign them homework. I had this kid put, turn in homework one time. It wasn't, the, that's not a good picture of him. He cheated. He cheated on his paper. He cheated on his homework. And as I'm reading his homework, I'm thinking, wow, this is really good. Hey, I need to look this word up. And then I start thinking about it. If, if I need to look this word up, how is this 18-year-old kid coming up with these words? Hmm. Now, I, I happen to be a master of Google food. Okay? You take the first line of that paper, and you type it into Google, and what pops up on the internet? All the things. whole, yeah, the whole, his whole paper came up, I mean, it was instant. It was number one search. So I had this kid's paper in one hand and the Google stuff on the other, and I'm like, this is identical. What did he do? He played drives. He, played drives. he copy pasted. All he did was take out all the references. <laughs> and so I had to call him up. Hey, I need to see you in the office. And what I had done with his paper is I took his paper and I highlighted with a bright yellow highlighter every word that was identical. And I stuck it in my desk drawer. I made a copy of it. So I had the original in my hand when it came in the office. And I said, hey man, I'm really enjoying your paper. Is this, did you do all this? Yep. Wow, I'm really impressed with your work. 
I had to look up some words. Did you maybe use a thesaurus to get some of these words? He said, yep. Folks, the words that he used, and biblical studies words are, are weird anyway. You can't find them in a thesaurus. He said, yeah, yeah, I used a thesaurus. And I reached into my desk drawer. I mean, this wasn't fun. It's a funny story now. I reached into my desk drawer and I pulled out his paper that I highlighted and I set it beside me. I said, look, I know what you did. And you could just see, and this, this, this guy's a pastor's kid, he's in Bible college, he's just cheating on his paper. And you can see his chin hit his chest and you can see tears start, start to rise. And I said, look, here's the thing. God loves you. God loves you so much. And if you're stuck for time, if you have to turn, I'd rather have you turn in a bad paper that's your words than do something like this. Because you're that's not you're not learning anything. I'd rather you get a D in the class than have to deal with this. You know, I tell you the story for this reason. That kid took it to heart. He lost credit for a four-credit college class in a two-year curriculum. So he had to find a way to make up those credits. That kid made him up. That kid is now the kind of guy who is in church leadership and should be. Not because uh, he never made a mistake, but because he made a mistake, he received correction, and he reformed his character. I wish he lived in Jackson. I'd twist his arm. You need to come to this church. We'd love to have you. I tell you that story for this reason. It got his attention. He graduated, married, started a family. He now owns a successful business, a successful Christian business. And he's a leader in the church. He is an example of godliness. So what does it look like to be sound in the faith? You go back to Paul's apostleship. To be sound in the faith, to be... Uh, a mature disciple, you have to be sound in the faith, you have to trust God. You have to have correct understanding of key theolog theological beliefs that result in godliness, a reverent awe for God that shows up in daily life. With the goal of godliness in mind, we need the discipline individually and as a community to keep at it and the courage to accept correction whenever it comes. You see, godliness is the goal, but it doesn't happen on its own. Godliness takes discipline. When Ernest Shackleton left with uh, left 22 men in Antarctica to make that 850-mile journey across the hostile ocean in a tiny sailboat, the outcome was uncertain. Just like when Paul sent Titus to the island of Crete to set things in order and appoint elders, the outcome was uncertain. But both men needed the same things. They needed a clear picture of what they were trying to accomplish. They needed to keep at it. And finally, they need, they need to stay on course through correction. You know, uh, modern American culture is getting more and more like the people of Crete. I, uh, I read uh, as part of my job. Uh, the, I actually have to fill out a report every year about what I read during the year. And I've read several books that say the same thing. They comment on where American culture is. And one of the things that these books Three or four of them have said the same kind of thing. That what's happening to American culture is that we've sort of lost the idea of God. We've lost that reverent awe for the Creator that leads to a change in actions. Our kids and grandkids are losing that. And so what do we do? At, how do we, like, do we just go chase them around and hit them with a stick? It's not a bad idea. Maybe it's not the only idea. But I think when we as a community can understand that godliness starts with this reverent awe of who God is that comes out of our life and, and in what we do towards one another, as we become a community characterized by godliness, then it's a place where the world walks in and they say, this is different. What's different? You see, these kids are getting lost. They don't know what's right from wrong. And when they come in here and not get hit over the head with a stick, we meet them really honestly, truly where they are. And then show them an example of what it looks like to be that fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. When we truly do that, then that's what God wants. 
That's the goal. That's the purpose of the church. To do that. As the, uh, as the praise team comes up and as the guys get ready for the offering. Uh, we've actually gone longer than we usually go, so it's, uh, it's going to cost you extra today. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray together and, and ask God to help us be godly people. Father, I pray that as we look into your word, uh, Titus had a problem on the island of Crete. And the problem was the culture that was around it. The people of Crete were difficult and hard to work with. And folk, uh, Lord, the, the people that we work with, the people of Jackson County, Michigan, is difficult to work with. The culture is slipping, Lord. So now pray, Father, you'd help us to be godly people. Not perfect people, but people in love with you so much, in awe and inspired by you so much, that it comes out in our daily lives. That we seek to be the kind of people who would be qualified to be elders, Lord. Help us to understand this picture you put in your word. Help us to look into our lives and see where we need to change. And then, Lord, help us to make those changes. Father, I thank you so much for my friends. I thank you that it's, it's good to be home. I pray for those folks in the body who are hurting, those folks who have physical and spiritual needs, Lord. I pray that you be with them. And I ask that you bless this offering, Lord, that we would put it to good use. And we just praise you in Christ's name. Amen.
Jesus, 